Hello everyone and welcome to the Green Man channel. Hope you're all good and well. So I finally reached the end of the Malazan Book of the Fallen series, or at least the 10 main books, having now read The Crippled God. Um, and you know, what, what a fantastic way I thought to finish this series off. I mean, you've got some really good climaxes here, um, lots of good character moments, a bit of a mixture of lighter moments with obviously the more heavy, darker moments. Um, and so the book worked well, I think, as a sort of capping off of Ericsson's last and somewhat complex, you know, um, fantasy series here. Um, I will say, I think I have suffered uh, whilst reading this series from something I would call Malazan first time read syndrome, uh, where I feel that, you know, only reading this series once is not enough. And it feels like you are, or I certainly have missed things probably things even on a, you know reading this book that would have probably made more sense uh, had I read this series maybe twice or had I revisited some of the previous books before reading this final entry I'm sure I would have picked up on more details although I had the, the gist of what was going on um, and I have noticed obviously the foreshadowing and some of the key elements of previous books and some of the you know the, the characters or realizing enough about characters and their their parts in previous books to understand enough of what is going on here to appreciate the, the conclusions of this series and I did find it still a satisfying conclusion despite everything I've said just just now or despite having that feeling of having a bit of a Malazan first time read syndrome and not quite sort of um you know, fully uh, appreciating everything uh, about this series. So um, I think some of the, so just to talk briefly now, what I usually do in these videos, as you know, is a quick spoiler free review. And then I talk more uh, in, you know, I pick out favorite moments from the book. And uh, that is where you do get some plots, some usually some spoilers um, and sometimes some pretty major ones. So. I do a warning before I reach that part of the video so you can turn off if you're not interested in hearing any spoilers. But the key plot lines of this book um, obviously are following on from where we were left off with a big cliffhanger really with the Bone Hunters and then Naruk at the end of the previous book, Dust of Dreams. And um, this time we are following, um, you know, what, what we discover what's left of the Bone Hunters on their march through the Glass Desert. Um, and uh, we are slowly getting an understanding of, um, you know, the purpose, their mission, and the role of the crippled gods here. I mean, the title of this book, right, is a bit of a giveaway. There is a lot that in this final book is revolving around the crippled gods and these sort of final conflicts that are happening around the crippled gods, if you like. And uh, we're also introduced here to a race, a really interesting race called the Four Crawler Sail. You have, you know, interesting physical appearance. They're very long. They sort of have a lot of flexibility in their joints and things, and they're very, uh, very resilient um, and an extremely difficult uh, opponent to face. Therefore, for a lot of our protagonists in this book, um, instead of uh, you know Storm, Storm, Stormy, and Gessler, um, and their alliance with the Kachanch and Mal uh, as they face off the Fortcrawl, or they face the Fortcrawl Sail. Uh, that whole um, part of this book is certainly perhaps maybe my favourite. I mean, I'm going to talk in my favourite moments about some scenes there, but amazing stuff with them. Um, and also you have perhaps I wasn't quite as as big or mad about this part of things with the Tisley Ozen and Yed and Derrick. Um, but the book didn't lose any momentum. This book didn't lose momentum, whereas with some of the other previous books, particularly in the second half of this series, I've found that it's been hard to really sort of fully embrace and engage uh, the writing of Stephen Erickson. And I found that less with this final book, perhaps because there was just so much momentum. As the book went on, it got more and more interesting, more and, more and more tense and exciting with a lot of the battle scenes you had and a lot of the character interactions. So for me, it felt like this book was slightly better at still um, keeping me keeping my attention than perhaps some of the other books have been, or at least where I really had to concentrate to follow certain scenes or, or you know, scene changes, as it were. This one, I think, does a better job. 
and it also has uh, just some just seriously epic moments and climactic moments that um, do serve well, uh, particularly in the sort of aftermath of a lot of the foreshadowing that we've had in previous books and in previous scenes uh, from this book even. So I think it's just really, really great stuff that we're getting. Um, so yeah, I enjoyed that. So I liked the Stormy and Gessler stuff a lot. I liked the Bone Hunters mission. Um, you know, the toughness of this glass desert and just how, you know, um, challenging and testing it is for, um, you know, all the characters involved in this. And, and Blistig in particular, I think, is someone who you really get to sort of see, um, you know, a, quite a bit of in this book and his kind of interesting or, or his struggle um, with sort of facing up to what he is having to do here and and, and all of that sort of thing. Um, it's difficult without going into major spoilers here, I think. Um, and also, you know, uh, as I say, I did still enjoy the Tisley Ozen and Yedin Derrick part of this book as well. Um, despite me saying probably one of my less favourite parts, but it still carries, it still kept me going. It's, there was still enough momentum in all of those scenes, so still really good stuff. All right, so I'm now going to move on to my favourite moments, my favourite moments of the Crippled Gods. The first of which features, um, once again, Shirky Lau. I always seem to have favourite moments involving Shirky Lau in this series. I think it's just because of her blunt, down-to-earth nature and that she doesn't mince her words. And she's talking about men in this scene with, with Phil Ash um, and, you know, kind of uh, <laughs> talking about how... Uh, the men that she often saw and met with were often happy because she offered them sex without any complications. And um, yeah, and she's talking to Felash about this. So um, here's Felash talking first, I think. So while being with you, most of them still miss the point. And um, uh, Shirk responds, very astute, Highness. Yes, they miss the point entirely. And Felash says, because what you offered was sex without complications. And then she says, exactly, brainless. Yes, uh, says Shirk, and that freed them, and freedom made them happy or anyway forgetful for at least a short, um, a short period of time. Uh, next up in my favourite moments is uh, parts involving um, the Tisleozen and Yedin Derrick, or at least Yedin Derrick here really, and his sword because um, Bedak observes that at the end of his sword is an impaled head. Now, Yedin Derek has been wondering, why, why does his sword feel so heavy? So um, this is where uh, Bedak, she, she nodded down at his sword. He glanced at it. Elio's and head was impaled on the blade from the top of the skull down and out through the neck, which had already been half severed. He grunted, no wonder it felt heavy. Um, that was me trying to do a voice that would, you know, maybe Yed and Derek's voice, if I could imagine what his voice would sound like. <laughs> Next up, I actually really liked this bit with Fiddler, um, where he is sort of imagining that Whiskey Jack were there with him um, in this scene, and he's remembering Whiskey Jack, and it's nice to kind of have these sort of moments in the books where you are getting references to characters that have been in the series before, that may no longer be with us, like Whiskey Jack, and uh, Fiddler is remembering him here, and he's remembering what he'd be telling him if this were if he were with him at that time. So he, this is him imagining Whiskey Jack talking. You'll do right, soldier, because you don't know how to do anything else. Doing right, soldier, is the only thing you're good at. And if it hurts, too bad. Stop your bitching, Fid. Besides, you ain't as alone as you think you are. Um, so I enjoyed that one quite a bit. You know, some of the, my favourite moments aren't necessarily the big battle sequences. They are just character moments where they are linking you back to previous characters or previous parts of the Malazan story as a whole. Um, this next, this I really liked this moment actually, where this is Kilmandaros defending the sort of legacy of Anamanda Rake um, when she comes to blows with Erastas. So she overhears this conversation Erastas is having with sexual, 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 I can't, I can't say the name there, sexual laugh. Um, and Kilmandaros, so this is, this is me, um, I'm now going to read this paragraph. Kilmandaros had drawn close during the conversation and a hand was a sudden blur in a corner of Sekul, <laughs> Sekul's vision, but the blow she struck Erastas was impossible to miss. 
as ribs snapped and he was thrown from his feet. He struck the ground, rolled once and then curled up around the damage to his chest. She managed to stand to him, to stand over him. You will cease speaking ill of him, she said in a low voice. We did not always agree, often we quarrelled. But the son of darkness was a man of integrity and honour. No longer will I permit you to spit on his name. He is dead and your voice lives on like the cry of a cowardly crow, Erastas. You are never his match and even in death he stands taller than you in all your guises. Do you think I do not hear your resentment, your envy? It disgusts me. And uh, yeah, I just thought that was a great sort of um, moment where she's defending and Amanda Rake there, um, really cool. Uh, and my last favourite moment is really just this whole sequence towards the end of the book involving Stormy, Gessler, Fulcrum de Sale, this, this um, sister reverence, I think um, her name is, um, and Hood. And the way everything comes together in this amazing sequence of events and, you know, you get tragedy, you get uh, a great sort of final confrontation. And when Hood comes along, because this whole thing has happened, right, where um, a god uh, has, um, you know, because of something Casa Orlong has done, um, we see this, this event where it rains blood and it brings back the dead to life because of uh, this um, this whole God thing, right, that's happened. I don't know how else to describe it um, adequately here, but because of that, Hood comes back to life effectively and it's just, uh, again, just a brilliant part for me of this book, that whole little bit of the story, the way all of that unfolds and comes together is uh, quite something to witness. Um, so yeah, that's my sort of final favourite part of this of this book. And it brings me to the end of my coverage, really, albeit it has been quite brief. It has been more of me just speaking about general thoughts than specifically doing any detailed summaries of these books. Um, you know, if you want that, I think there are lots of YouTube channels that provide much more detail uh, on this series than I necessarily have for me. It's been fun just kind of reading the books and picking out favourite moments. Perhaps some favourite moments that maybe are different from your own if you've read through the series. Again, I think this series really needs me to read this again. Particularly, um, I have said, I, I think in previous videos, I've been thinking of doing a Malazan ranking when I reach the end of the series, as I now have at least reached the end of the ten books. But to be honest, I don't think I can do a ranking at this point. It feels like... I'd have to revisit the books or reread the 10 books again in full to be able to do that properly. Um, and yes, I think I do from the first reads have my favourites. But, you know, this last book would probably be one of them, actually. I think from the second half of the series, The Triple God has done the most to, you know, pull me back into the series. After in part some books like I would say Reaper's Gale and um, Dust of Dreams, I, I, I found those tricky. Um, but this one certainly got me back and good timing considering this was the last book of the series, the epic climax, the final confrontations, all of the dramatic stuff, a lot of it happening here. So I was glad that, that we got, uh, for me, some of Ericsson's best stuff in this last book. Um, and it felt like a satisfying overall conclusion to this series. So anyway, let me know what you thought of this series if you read it in the comments or this book. Um, whether you think, like I think, I should probably reread this entire series again, um, perhaps before too long, to really appreciate it some more. Um, otherwise, for me, thanks if you've been patient with me, following uh, in my footsteps, sort of getting my reflections and thoughts and waiting for these videos. Perhaps if you have been doing that, I'm sorry, but certainly these last couple of videos have taken a very long time for me to get out. It's just been tough getting through. I think um, getting through the books with all the other sort of commitments of the channel and, and my life outside of this this YouTube channel. So, but otherwise, otherwise, thanks very much, everybody. Until next time, bye for now.